Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon lesson this morning comes from Colossians 3. We just heard those verses a few minutes ago. Your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a question I think we all have been asked before. You're at a a party or you're at a get-together at someone's house and you meet someone for the very first time and very early on in that conversation, this question might come up, so what do you do? Have you ever been asked that before or maybe you've asked someone that question? So what do you do? I once heard that Americans like to ask that question very early in a conversation with someone they've just met. And the reasoning is this. Americans tend to identify themselves with their occupation, with their job, with what they do. So how would you answer that question? What do you do? Well, as I look at our people here today, I can see that we can answer that question in all sorts of ways. I see farmers. I see doctors and nurses. I see stay-at-home moms. I see people who work in tool and dye, people who work for Whirlpool, uh, people who work at one of the power plants in our area. I also see people who might not be working right now, who might be in between jobs or who might be retired or maybe you're still in school. I think it's really interesting that we identify ourselves with what we do with our job or our occupation. I think generally speaking, it's because we want to feel important. We want to feel like we're making a difference. And so it's easy then to find my worth, to find my status in a title or in a position. That type of thinking is especially dangerous if we ever apply it to our Christian faith. And what I mean by that is is this. It can be really dangerous if we ever think that my status before God depends on a position I might hold at church. Or it depends on how important I think I am for a church. Or that it depends on my own faithfulness to God. The Colossians were struggling with that a, a little bit. Just a little background on the the Christian church at the city called Colossae. It's a really interesting story. Uh, Their pastor was a man by the name of Epaphras, and he decides to travel to Rome to visit the Apostle Paul because of uh, problems that he and the Colossian Christians uh, are going through. It was a 1,300-mile trip, and Paul was in jail in Rome. And we don't know all of the issues that were going on, but when you read through Colossians, you begin to make sense of them a little bit. See, what seems to be happening was this, that there was a group of people, most likely outsiders, coming in trying to lead the Colossian Christians astray. And this seems to what have been their their teaching was. They were saying that faith in Jesus is all well and good, but it's not enough. It's too simple. And if you wanted to have a real relationship with the Lord, if you wanted to have a a really good relationship with him, well, it was up to you to get this higher knowledge, this higher wisdom of God, sort of like a a mystical experience. These outsiders were also adding elements of the Jewish religion and pagan religion uh, to Christianity, too. And instead of pointing people to Jesus and his all-sufficient saving work, they were pointing them back to themselves, saying that your status before God depends on you getting this higher knowledge, this sort of mystical experience with God. Now, unfortunately, that's a problem that we can fall into as well. Not necessarily embracing that same type of philosophy, but But sometimes in our lives, it can be really easy to think that our status before God depends on us and what we do. That type of thinking can creep into our lives when we do something good for someone else. And instead of seeing that as an opportunity to thank the Lord for what he has given us in Jesus, 
it can easily turn into an opportunity to pat ourselves on our own backs. It can creep into our lives even when we gather together for worship. Instead of an opportunity to, to grow in our faith through word and sacrament, it can easily turn into an opportunity to look around and see who's not here and think that our status before God depends on my faithful worship attendance. It can creep into our lives when we gather together for group Bible study, something that, that is really good, a lot of wonderful blessings. But instead of growing in our faith, sometimes that Pharisee inside of us likes to come out and think that my status before God depends on my Bible IQ. But as you read through Colossians, you begin to realize that our status before God does not depend on our good works. It does not depend on our faithfulness to God. And that's a great thing. Because if it did, we would be in serious trouble. Just a chapter earlier, Paul mentions this in Colossians chapter 2. He says, there was a time when you were dead in your sins. Dead in your sins. Completely separated from God. You had no status before God. But notice that's a past tense he uses. This is what you once were. What are you now? Well, our lesson answers that. Paul says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. See, as a Christian, as a believer in Christ, your status and your identity before God does not come from a job title. It does not come from your family tree. It doesn't even come from your own faithfulness. Instead, it comes from God's faithfulness to you. It comes from Christ and what Christ has done for you. Notice what Paul calls us in these verses. First of all, he says that you are God's chosen people, handpicked by God. And to show that it was an act of his grace and not because of anything special about you, God chose you before the creation of the world. He had you on his heart and on his mind and he made good on his choice as he brought you to faith through the work of the Holy Spirit. You are God's chosen people. Notice what else he calls us in this, this verse. He says, you are also holy. Holy means to be without sin. Isn't that an amazing thing for him to say to us? That we are holy right now? Because so much in my life seems to be the complete opposite. Sinful thoughts, sinful words, and sinful actions. So how can we be called holy? Well, Jesus has made you holy. Because Jesus has taken away your sin. See, at the cross, Jesus took your sin and he placed it on his own son. But he also did something else. He took Jesus' perfect life, his holiness, his righteousness, and he's wrapped you with it as well. 2 Corinthians says this, God made him, that's Jesus, God made Jesus who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. When you hear the word saint today, when most people use that word, they're usually talking about someone who is really good, a, a super Christian maybe. Well, when the Bible uses the word saint, it means something different. That's because the word saint literally means someone who is holy. And so when the Bible uses the word saint, it's talking about you. It's talking about me. Because we have been made holy, not because of ourselves, but through Jesus. Through his death on the cross, and because God has given you Jesus' perfect life through faith in him. You are also holy. The last thing that Paul says is this, you are also dearly loved. Boy, it doesn't get better than that, does it? So often in our lives, we might not feel loved. So often in our lives, we might feel all alone. So often in our lives, we might feel the sense of despair. 
But who loves you? Your heavenly Father. The God who created the heavens and the earth. The God who rules over the winds and the waves. The God who actively preserves all of his creation loves you dearly. He loves you so much that he's not willing to let anything separate you from him. Not your sin, not your problems, not even death. That's why Paul says this in Romans chapter 8. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is what you are. That is your identity. That's your status. That's your worth. You are God's chosen people, handpicked by God. You are holy through the blood of Jesus, and you are dearly loved and a child of your heavenly Father. So then, how does that impact our lives? How does that affect our earthly callings, our earthly vocations as an employee or as a boss, as a parent or as a spouse, uh, as a grandparent or as a student? Well, Paul continues on in our lesson, and this is what he says. He says, Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. That's a pretty tall order, isn't it? And as we keep on reading through Colossians chapter 3, we see that Paul has specific instructions for husbands and wives, children, and, and even slaves. So when you take a look at the list, how are you doing? Are you clothing yourself with, with kindness and goodness? Are you bearing with one another? Are you forgiving one another as the Lord has forgiven you? Well, you might say, sometimes, uh, except when I don't get enough sleep and I'm in a bad mood. Sometimes, except when my boss is acting like a jerk and doesn't appreciate the work that I do. Eh, sometimes, except when my children talk back to me and, and don't listen to, to what I tell them. Sometimes, except when my spouse doesn't do what I want my spouse to do. One of the interesting things in our lesson for today is something that Paul says to slaves. Now, before we talk about that, it's good to keep in mind what slavery was during Paul's day. It was very different than what we think of when we think of slavery in our country. Uh, slavery in our country was an abomination. It was based on uh, race and also based on human kidnapping. Slavery in Paul's day w was very different. Most of the time, it was done because someone needed to pay a debt to someone else but couldn't pay it. Slaves generally were treated better than what we think of slaves today. Uh, slaves sometimes were even part of the family, and slaves could even pay for their freedom. But certainly life as a slave was really hard and difficult. But notice what Paul says to them. He says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. He tells them to obey their earthly masters even when they're not keeping an eye on them. He tells them to work at it with all their heart, regardless of what someone might say to them, regardless of what someone might do to them, regardless of how someone might treat them. He calls them to live their Christian faith, to live their Christian life, no matter what the circumstances are. And the Lord has called you and me to do the very same thing. Even when we don't get enough sleep. 
even when our boss does not appreciate us, even when our children don't listen to us, even when our spouse doesn't do what we want our spouse to do, even when people in our lives can act pretty loveless. Paul calls us to put on patience and goodness and kindness, to bear with one another in love and to forgive as we have been forgiven. And here's how you can do it. Remember first and foremost who you are serving. You're serving the Lord. The Lord who has chosen you to be his own. The Lord who has made you holy through the blood of his Son. And the Lord who loves you dearly. And the Lord who has a place for you in heaven. And so don't think that you need to be a pastor or a teacher to serve the Lord. Don't think you need to be a missionary traveling to the ends of the earth to serve the Lord. Don't think you need to have the highest position in a church to serve the Lord. Certainly we need people to do those things and there are lots of blessings through them. But you serve the Lord in whatever circumstances you're in because the Lord has placed you there. You serve the Lord as a parent who changes dirty diapers and tell your children about Jesus. You serve the Lord as an employee who lives your Christian faith even when it's really hard to at work. You serve the Lord as a child by listening to your parents and showing them love and respect. You serve the Lord as a boss as you treat your workers with respect and honor. No matter who you are, no matter what circumstances you're in, you always are serving the Lord first and foremost. As Paul says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Because remember who you are and what Christ has made you to be. Chosen, holy, and dearly loved. And whatever calling you're in, be who Christ has already made you to be. Amen.